Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Urbana-Champaign. We're in our sanctuary watching from home. And those who have joined us today, including our own Reverend KB, everyone sharing our space today will remain masked and safely spread out through the sanctuary. And you are invited when you arrived to grab a color-coded lanyard, red, to indicate that you feel cautious being in shared space and prefer to keep a greater distance, or green to indicate that you feel safer being physically close together, yellow for somewhere in between. Please look around and be aware and respectful of others' needs and boundaries while we share this space. Though this experience is far from the way things used to be, UUCUC is leaning into the messiness of our future together, and I am endlessly grateful for all of the grace and flexibility I continue to see in our community. This congregation's mission is to build a community, seek inspiration, promote justice, and find peace. We're a church of many different beliefs about good and evil, life and death, God, gods, or the nature of the universe. But amid all that difference, we come together week after week, year after year, and strive to do the work of beloved community. Know that in whatever form you find us today, whether you're here with me in the sanctuary, or watching from home, or tuning into this recording weeks later, this service is here for you. This morning's service is titled Sacred Sex Ed, which hopefully got your attention. But it's more than just a clickbait title. If you were under the impression that churches are limited to abstinence-only messages or seeing sex and sexuality as sinful, then stick around because this service is for you. In fact, Unitarian Universalist congregations across America have been offering accurate, comprehensive sex ed in our Sunday schools for over 40 years. This is a core part of our faith. The Our Whole Lives curriculum, OWL or OWL for short, starts as early as kindergarten and programs are offered for all ages, including a new one being developed specifically for senior citizens. Today's service is about lifting up this program, this part of our faith, and reflecting on how vital, how meaningful, how sacred it truly is to make this information available to our community and our youth. I hope that the time we share this morning will be joyful, healing, and illuminating for every one of us. And I hope you will continue the conversation beyond today. If you want to follow along with a written order of service, you can find that link online just below this video on our website. If you want to chat with your fellow UUCUC members, you can find the live stream chat box on our YouTube page. I will also add for those in the sanctuary, because of our technical difficulties that delayed us a little bit this morning, we are not going to be able to project onto the wall the online pre-recorded aspects of this service that we had planned. So that means this is a phones out service. <laughs> you can get your phones out, put them on silent so they don't ring, <laughs> but get your phones out. And when time comes and those online are watching some of the video elements of this service, you will be invited to watch along on your devices or on your neighbor's device. <laughs> Remember that because we are live, there's still time to make your own contributions to our shared joys and sorrows later in the service. To do that, you just email your message to joysandsorrows at uucuc.org. There will also be a chance to write joys and sorrows. There are written joys and sorrows cards at the back of the sanctuary if you prefer that, and we'll collect them later in the service. This congregation chooses to begin every Sunday together with a formal acknowledgement of the indigenous nations of this land. It's a practice that connects us to the history of this place, that roots us in our own responsibilities as stewards and members of a wider community. So whether you're here in the sanctuary or wherever you are listening from today, I invite you to allow yourself a moment to sink down into the deeper history of that specific place. 
Think of all the lives that have taken root here. Those who lived here before you did, the builders who built these walls, the creatures of every shape and size who have lived and died nearby, the miles of glacial ice that once moved across this prairie. And yes, the many people and peoples who stewarded this land for generations. <laughs> Here on Green Street, we worship on the land of the Kikapoi, the Peoria, the Miamiwa, and the Sioux. These people still exist today and are committed to a continued struggle for survival and self-determination. Wherever you are this morning, I invite you to take a breath and consider the unique history and peoples of the land you are resting on. May we always remember where we are, the sacredness of this place and the many people human and otherwise, who belong to it with us. And now we will light our chalice with words from Reverend KB. Good morning, beloved community. Good morning. Good morning. Um, as I mentioned last week, um, that land acknowledgement that Reverend Sally just shared comes from her heart and spirit, and um, I just think it's uh, powerful and phenomenal. And thank you for writing that for us and bringing that for us every week. As you all know, here in the sanctuary and those at home, it is part of our UU faith that each time we come together in all kinds of ways, we light a chalice. And this is a signal of hope, of light in the darkness to guide our way. And I love the, the, the words that all the darkness of the entire universe cannot diminish the light of a single candle. Those at home, if you have a chalice handy and you'd like to light yours with us, please prepare and we'd love to have you join us in this way. As now, together, I'm going to invite us to say, they're not on the screen, they're in your OOS. You know, pivoting is what we do in the UU. That's what we do. So I invite you to, as we together, we're going to say the words, and then I'm going to go over and light the chalice for us. I'd like to join you at the mic for the words. And let us consider the words as we say them, as though we're hearing them for the very first time. Can we do that together? We extinguish the, oh, I've said the extinguish. Oh, see, I'm just seeing if you're paying attention. Let's go. There are no words in the OOS. So you know what? I'm going to read them and you say them back to me. We've got this. As we kindle this flame, we reignite our commitment to our congregational mission. To build, to build community, seek inspiration, seek inspiration. Promote, justice. promote justice, and find peace. And We've got us quite an amazing hymn to start off, to take us further in our worship. So I'd like to invite you, those who are able, please rise. And we are going to all together sing hymn number 361, Enter, Rejoice, and Come In. And if this is not a hymn of rejoicing, I don't know what is. So I invite you, consider the words, let your spirit, let your body, let all who you, that you are sing Hum, 
Let's be together. Enter, rejoice, and come in. Hymn number 361. Thank you. singing. Thank you all. Now we're going to hear a story read by our consulting DRE coming to us all the way from Indiana, which means get out your phones. The book she will read is part of our Our Whole Lives curriculum for kids in kindergarten and first grade. It's a story that fits into a lesson about bodies and how we name and talk about all our various body parts and about the bodies of other people and how different they can be. So those in the sanctuary, if you have your live stream up, you can turn on your volume and get ready to watch together. Bodies Are Cool by Tyler Fetter. Big bodies, small bodies, dancing, playing, happy bodies. Look at all these different bodies. Look around, look left, look right, look in front of you, look behind you. Bodies are cool. Lanky bodies, squat bodies, tall bodies, short, wide, narrow, Somewhere in the middle bodies. Bodies are cool. Round bodies, muscled bodies, curvy curves, straight bodies, jiggly wiggly fat bodies. Bodies are cool. Dark skin, olive skin, Every shade of brown skin, pinky pale or peach skin. Say it with me, bodies are cool. Poofy hair, wavy hair, springy curls and flat hair. Lots of hair or no hair, bodies are cool. Leg hair, Armpit hair, fuzzy lip and chin hair, brows meet in the middle hair, bodies are cool. Hazel eyes, brown eyes, monolids and round eyes, blind and wearing glasses eyes, bodies are cool. Crooked faces, 
bump nosed faces, flat nose, full lips, gap toothed faces, stick out ears and thin lipped faces. Bodies are cool. Freckled bodies, dotted bodies, rosy patched or speckled bodies, dark skin swirled with light skin bodies. Bodies are cool. Hairy fingers, wrinkly fingers, dimpled elbows, chubby fingers, wobbly arms, and stubby fingers. Bodies are cool. Soft tummies, saggy tummies, flat or sticky out tummies, innies, outies, pregnant tummies. Bodies are cool. Thick legs, scrawny legs, knobby knees and long legs, rolled up to the table legs. Bodies are cool. Faint scars, bold scars, stripes from getting bigger scars, marks that tell a story, scars, bodies are cool. This body, that body, his and her and their body, however you define your body, bodies are cool. Growing bodies, aging bodies, features rearranging bodies, magic ever changing bodies. Bodies are cool. My body, your body, every different kind of body, all of them are good bodies. Bodies are cool. I'm going to invite you to turn your sound off because the live stream's ready for me to start. And folks at home, we're just so glad you're with us today. And we in the sanctuary, we can do eye twinklings at each other because we're, we're finding our way together. Good news is, for the next time, and Reverend Sally's going to guide us when it's time, um, anyone who would like, the live stream is going in Fellowship Hall, and we can just stroll over there because that's a longer one. And we hate to have anyone miss it. And then when it's done, we stroll back. You're welcome to stay here also. So thank you all. Each Sunday, we bring our individual joy, sorrow, sorrows, and concerns to our time together. Please bring to mind the joys and sorrows in your life as in a moment we sing our blessing song. Please sing along or let it wash over you. For those with us, of us online, there's still time to send in a joy or sorrow to be shared aloud. You'll see an email address during the blessing song below your screen. And for those of you here in the house, as Reverend Sally shared earlier, you'll find cards in the, the pew behind, in front of you on the back of it. And please feel free to write out your joys and sorrows and the ushers will come down. And if you'll pass them to the sides, they'll collect them and bring them forward for us. As we let us come together now in a time of breathing and quiet peace as we enjoy our blessing song.
as we come together now to receive the joys and sorrows shared here this morning online and together. And uh, Reverend Sally, would you mind bringing me my phone? Good thing my head's connected, I'll tell you what. Thank you. Thank you. First invited to enter into a time of quietness. If you'll join me in some deep breaths of centering, becoming aware that this is the moment of life that exists. There is no other. To remember that we are alive in the here and now. This is the only moment that will ever exist. Let us be here and not miss it. Let us nudge the inner workings of our minds to calm and seek a peaceful place deep within. We might soften our gaze or close our eyes, slow our breathing, lower our shoulders, allow ourselves to go deeper. I invite you to breathe in and feel an awareness of your heart both the physical one beating even now and the metaphorical one that is spirit mystery that connects you with all that you love and all that loves you in this life, that holds you in beauty and draws you into awe and wonder and joy. You and I and each living thing on this planet and beyond that is mystery is an intricate part of the interdependent web of existence stretching through the universe in this very moment, a web that is unfathomably expansive and strong and holds all that is our lives. And whether you are here in the sanctuary or in Fellowship Hall or at home, I invite you to imagine now the burdens of your heart shifting and lifted and those of our community held by all of us and by this web of life and love moving through space and time from our ancestors to our great, 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 great grandchildren holding us together. And let us now, in this moment of silence, prepare our hearts to hold one another tenderly, sharing our joys and sorrows as sacred stuff. We each have those that are too deep to name sometimes. So whether they are named or in the silence of our hearts, they are precious. Those who wish to share an embodied response, I invite to do so as I prepare to share those out loud that are coming before us. For joys and sorrows, for sorrows or concerns, put our hands over our heart. You are invited to if you so choose to. And for joys, spirit fingers, which I learned last week is familiar to this congregation, if you feel like it. Let me see what's shared from, from online. From Gail Cohen. My friend Cheryl not only shared my 1212 birthday, but my passion for writing. We were kindred spirits and collaborated on myriad writing projects over the decades. I feel so lucky to have had her in my life for over 30 years. Cheryl passed away on Saturday, morning the 12th. I miss her already terribly. I had heard about this, Claudia and David. Claudia and David are grieving the death on Thursday this week of our beloved cat Buddha. He was a long, a beautiful, long-haired black cat who loved everyone he met 
and dispatch any mouse with large cat demeanor. He slept under the covers, this is Claudia, I think, on my shoulder each night, and he had been the soul of our family for 15 of 17 years, and we miss him so very much. And I know there's a number of folks in our community who've lost pets this month, and pets are our spiritual children and our guides. We are their staff, and they are our caretakers. I mean, in very real ways, this is a soul loss. Blessings. From Sam Bashir's The Man of Many Hats. Joy for being here in the sanctuary and never again taking it for granted. Amen, amen. <sighs> it's amazing the things we can take for granted. Not this one. From Becky Dinsmore, joy that we are together and finding our way together. <laughs> Spirit. From Lane Schwartz, joy at being in person in this wondrous building after so long, and a sorrow that daylight savings time has come once again. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> For we night owls, oh yeah. <laughs> this is with the, this is without a name, to dwell together with you all and restart my work as an owl facilitator. So, yes. See, I did, I taught owl at the UCC years ago. It's a powerful program. I'm so delighted we have it here in so full ways. From David Wolf, I've completed my three-year training in somatic experiencing, a therapy to integrate the anxious mind and the body's instinctive wisdom. I look forward to finding ways to sign up for that. Congratulations, congratulations. I hope your class has more than 12. A bunch of us signed up right away and you're popular, so. In the midst of our community is the world. And if you would permit me now, I'd like to share a prayer for peace. This was written by Eric Cherry, inspired by, in, in reference to Ukraine. Will you join me in meditation in your own way? The history is complex, the politics are intense, the fear and anger are overwhelming, and the future is unclear. But glimpses of a hopeful vision will not be bombed into oblivion by anybody. In prayer, we call to mind the peacemakers, neighbors of differing faiths with different histories and different politics with different emotions who find room in each other, for each other, in their hearts, in their dreams, and in their lives. Those who firm, hold firmly to a vision of peace and justice anywhere in the world, but especially today in Ukraine. Spirit of life and love, be present with all who are suffering terribly from the violence in Ukraine. Lift up the hearts of those who fear. Inspire courage among the peacemakers. Be present with political leaders, ensuring a retreat from violence and a procession towards the peace table. And open our own hearts to compassion. Guide the hands of all those who are caring for the injured, the hungry, and the grieving and remind us of our complicity and responsibility. And lead us towards generous engagement. Move us always, always toward a vision of peace. 
you are invited to please take these next moments of beautiful music to find your own words, to ask for what you need, or simply to breathe and rest in this time of quiet meditation. Today's service is meant to lift up the Our Whole Lives program, or OWL, which this congregation has been running for years, for decades now. So some of you already know all about it, I'm sure. You've been a facilitator, or your kids were enrolled, or maybe you yourself are an OWL alum. But some here will have never heard of OWL, or it rings a bell, but you've never been closely involved. So I wanted to give you a chance to hear from our current OWL volunteers, give them a chance to speak for themselves about what it actually looks like inside our Our Whole Lives program. What does it actually mean to include comprehensive sex ed within our core commitments as a faith community? One of the things that OWL does so well is busting common myths about sex and sexuality and things that everyone supposedly knows. One of the games OWL classes will play is called Um Actually, <laughs> in which assumptions are rebutted with scientific facts and nuance and openness to different experiences. So this next message is a significant portion of the service which means if the phone watching earlier just wasn't working for you, I invite and encourage you to just get up and stroll into the fellowship hall where it is streaming on a gigantic screen, loud sound, beautiful resolution. This pre-recorded portion is about 10 minutes long. You are welcome to come back at the end of 10 minutes or simply enjoy fellowship hall. We'll give, uh, to those watching at home, thank you for your patience while we give our in-person viewers a moment to transition spaces. And you're welcome to stay, phone watchers. I'll be here. How would you like to teach sex ed? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, uh, uh, it's funny how you, it's funny how you pause. I don't know. I think there would certainly be awkward moments. Uh, like the, the answering of the question is an awkward moment. I would feel pretty nervous. Uh, it's a pretty heavy subject. Uh, what would be your hesitations? Well, just I don't know the curriculum or how it's done, so I'd like to have a little help sort of, you know, 
knowing what to say, what to do. Um, actually, it is okay to not feel like an expert in the material. The OWL training will give you a lot of information. And the really important thing about being an OWL facilitator is that you have uh, a desire to keep learning and you know, keep expanding your knowledge base. Uh, and the, you know, the only qualification really is that you are willing to do this job and to talk to kids about this stuff because it's important. You would worry, I would worry, that anything I say, they would, they would interpret as this is how my sex life is, you know, and uh, that's not necessarily something I want to share with, with children. Um, actually, the ability to maintain appropriate personal boundaries is a strength in facilitators. Good faci facilitators should be able to separate their own personal stories and journey from their role as facilitators because this should be about the students, not the facilitators. So that's why from day one, the ground rule is that facilitators will answer any questions about sexuality, but they will not answer any questions about their own personal sex lives. I do, however, recommend working on a good poker face because you don't want to inadvertently convey your feelings about a topic and you certainly don't want to make any topic seem taboo or shameful. What would be your hesitations? The awkwardness for sure, but also that I have kids who are either in the age group or nearing the age group for that kind of education. And so for me, teaching my own kids in a classroom setting would be pretty awkward and icky. Um, actually, that's a really good concern. I have kids, fourth grade and sixth grade now, that, and I also didn't want to be their teacher and be in their classroom. But because there are so many different age groups of OWL, uh, I have the opportunity to teach ages that my children are not. Uh, one of the reasons we need more OWL teachers is so that people like me who've been teaching OWL, whose children are now going to be in the 7th and ninth grade OWL class, can step out and let new people come in and teach. Well, I mean, I know OWL is a huge commitment, time-wise and effort-wise. Um, and uh, so that would be one hesitation I might have. Um, actually, it's really not that bad. Um, the K-1, for example, is only eight sessions, and the fourth through, through sixth grade is only 12 sessions. That's eight, 12 sessions. That sounds like a lot of time, a lot of class. I don't know that I'm ready for a whole class. Well, um, actually, if you get trained, one of the things you can do is you could sub and just kind of assist the first time. Um, another time you might be able to say, hey, this is something I feel really comfortable with this material and test out your your ability to be in the classroom. But is it all going to be on me, though, for that whole eight to 12 sessions or that whole class? Um, actually, you'd be part of a great teaching team. And the more teachers that we have, the more we can distribute the work and keep everybody from burning out. So some hesitations might be that... How does my life experience differ from what I need to teach? Mm, actually, let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the good things and the bad things that may be. Let's talk about sex. Well, I think people get uncomfortable talking about sex, and that's just one of those things. Our young people need us to be open and frank and honest about sex and sexuality. And also, there is enjoyment and there is also a lot of other issues around it. Thanks. I signed up to become an OWL facilitator because I believe in comprehensive sex education. 
but I don't think I really realized what I was getting into until I was driving to another state to participate in a weekend long retreat, talking to a bunch of strangers about sexuality. And I started to think I'm going to be a sex ed teacher that just, that doesn't sound like something I would do. And so I started the retreat the way most of our OWL students start OWL class. Head down, don't make eye contact, don't talk, get out your coloring pencils and just keep coloring. About an hour into the retreat, I was enthralled with the curriculum because I realized that it encompasses so many of my values that I care deeply about. Uh, first of all, diversity and inclusion, especially for the whole range of gender and sexual diversity, but also for intersex individuals, disabled individuals, people whose experiences are often omitted from traditional sex ed classes. But there's also so many other issues I care about, like sexual assault prevention through comprehensive consent education, through teaching about healthy relationships and what those look like by examining power dynamics in relationships. It's also about anti-bullying, a whole workshop on anti-bullying because so much bullying is related to sex and sexuality. It's also about breaking down harmful gender role stereotypes, harmful body image expectations, um, really critically examining media messages about bodies and sex and sexuality so that students can make their own informed choices that are not based on myths and stereotypes. So Teaching OWL is putting my values into action. In terms of actually teaching, I have really loved teaching the middle schoolers over the past few years even though my own children, or maybe especially because my own children were even younger, I learned so much about that seventh to ninth grade age, how great they are, um, the way they bring their humor and their vulnerability and their intelligence and their questions and their deflections to class and really push me to constantly think more deeply about sex education, about education in general, and about the possibilities that kids these age have for contributing to all the rest of us. Trained facilitators allow for us to have a strong program, which is life-changing and life-saving work. I don't say that lightly. So let me say that again, life-changing and the life-saving work. When you are taught about gender, about sexual orientation, about body positivity in very positive, affirming language, starting from a young age and having that reinforced over and over again during your time while you're at church. And let's just say you hear this information at church. So that instantly starts to make church this place where, wow. They're willing to talk to me about big life things, meaningful things here at church. And I often find that I will ask children, youth, even their parents and caregivers throughout their time while they're in our religious exploration program, who is a trusted adult in your child's life? And time and time again, whether it's from the children, whether it's from the adults in their life, it will be their OWL facilitator. And that is something they carry with them long after they walk out of the doors of this building. It seems like it's something that if you feel strongly that kids have accurate information, which I really do, um, there shouldn't be hesitation. I wouldn't, I wouldn't stop to, I wouldn't hesitate if I knew it, there was a need and it, I could fill that need. You're welcome to come back in if you want to, or stay where you are.
Welcome back as you find your way back into the sanctuary. And many thanks to our OWL facilitators and other willing volunteers who put that message together for us this morning. As they made clear, so much of sex ed is about just demystifying and demythifying things that don't get openly talked about. So it felt important to not have my voice be the only one this morning. Important to give everyone a glimpse into what it's actually like to volunteer in the OWL program, to demystify that, and to invite everyone to consider getting involved in this branch of our church life as we're recruiting to expand our program into new age groups next year. As one of our facilitators, Joe Omoosagie, said, and others in the video, it's okay to talk about sex. It's okay to laugh about sex. It's even okay to sing about sex. Early owl sessions, no matter what age, are often focused on breaking the ice and embracing the giggles. No owl-focused Sunday would be complete without a little bit of irreverence and laughter. Did you ever go through a phase, maybe this was just me, where nothing was more hilarious than reading fortune cookie fortunes or horoscope predictions and then tacking on in bed <laughs> or in my pants or between the sheets? As in this week, be careful what you wish for, you just might get it. In your pants, <laughs> truly the height of comedy. So I went to a UU Ministers group text this week, and I asked, what hymns make for the best in-bed punchlines? <laughs> so if you think you can compete with the UU Ministers I was chatting with, feel free to grab a hymnal here in the sanctuary. Find your own answers to this question, shout them out. But some of the popular responses I got were, we would be one. I am that great and fiery force. <laughs> come thou fount. Uh, the classic, one of my favorites, come, come, whoever you are. <laughs> when the spirit says do. And <laughs> for new parents whose kid finally fell asleep, voice still and small. <laughs> and of course, our opening hymn today, Enter, Rejoice, and Come In, between the sheets. <laughs> so in the spirit of laughter and opening our ears and hearts to hear this song anew, you're invited to stand once more, or if standing isn't comfortable, to remain seated and raise your voices together. You don't have to sing the amended lyrics, but now you'll never be able to unhear them. <laughs> Please join us in a reprise of number 361, Enter, rejoice, and come in. playing along. <laughs> I hope that you're participating in our March Madness hymnal competition, and maybe that twist on the hymns will add a little bit of extra spice to that competition. 
We, as you use, acknowledge that our circle of care doesn't stop with our congregation. We are deeply connected to the community we find ourselves in and to the wider world. Please continue to keep an eye on your E! News weekly newsletter for opportunities to show up, to find support, to get involved, and to be part of this community. Starting this week, there will actually be a treasure hunt hidden in every E! News, and winners of the treasure hunt each month will be treated to a coffee date with our own Reverend KB at a local cafe of your choice. So stakes are high. Keep your eyes peeled in this week's edition to learn more. There's also a special event next Sunday that you should know about. In the two years since we first switched to virtual church, two years almost exactly, we have joyfully welcomed 41 new members to our congregation. <laughs> now we are inviting those special members on a journey all through this building to get to know their new church home in person and experience some of the aspects of church life that didn't work over Zoom like making art together, meditating in shared space, digging in the garden, and of course, ringing the bell in our bell tower. If you have joined us in the last two years, I hope to see you there next Sunday, hope to see you here next Sunday at 1 p.m. And even if you're not part of that very special COVID cohort, you are all invited to show up and celebrate with them in an all ages tea time picnic on the South Lawn next Sunday at 3 p.m. We'll bring the tea, you bring your lawn chair and a favorite snack to share if you want. And hopefully the weather will cooperate. It'll be a perfect day to relax, greet old friends, meet new faces and have fun together. That's next Sunday at 3 p.m. And you can RSVP online. Remember too that our building remains open for small groups, RE classes and more. If your group feels ready to meet in person, you can reserve a room online or through our administrator, Brian Franklin. Each Sunday, in recognition of our very real interdependence and reliance on one another, we pass the plate and share our offering with an organization doing the work of justice in the world. During the month of March, our collection will be shared 50-50 with the Women in Need Recovery, or WIN Recovery, a local nonprofit that provides formerly incarcerated women with support for reintegrating into community life. We have a short video from Wynn to better explain the impact and importance of their work, which means once again, if you want to watch on your phone, you can, or I encourage you to... <gasps> Thanks, Avalon. All right, we have a short video from Wynn to better explain the impact and importance of their work. I invite you to watch it now. My name is Bethany Little, and I am the founder executive director of Women in Need Recovery. Uh, most of you guys know us as Wynn Recovery. I am very excited to be able to thank you all for uh, the support that you have given us in uh, the last few years. And, you know, without you, we wouldn't be able to live out our mission. Our mission is to provide a safe living foundation for formerly incarcerated women, being able to provide them with vitalized skills and support to transform and assist them in becoming successful citizens of our society and our community. Um, what we do is, is that we provide a safe home for women when they're coming out of prison, jail, treatment. During that time, uh, we provide them with the ability to face some of the things that they've never faced before, some of the trauma that they've never faced before. Being able to provide a strong foundation in recovery. Uh, we are able to help them reintegrate them back into the community by helping them and assisting them to go to school, uh, being able to assist them in getting uh, employment, uh, being able to help them reunite with their family. Uh, some of the greatest things that we have achieved is being able to, at the very end, 
uh, is being able to see them moving to their own home and providing them with all the necessities that they need to be able to live on their own. Um, we have been so successful in our mission that we have been able to help people in all areas other than Champaign. There are not too many places like us in the state of Illinois. So we get a lot of individuals in rural areas uh, where they come here and they come to get help and they end up staying here and making Champaign their home. Uh, we've been able to be recognized as a model for the state of Illinois in regards to uh, safe homes, in regards to transitioning uh, homes, in regards to uh, being able to provide the reentry services that women need. And because of our statewide recognition, we have had funders uh, fund us for the ability for us to expand statewide. And so not only do we have two homes in Champaign, uh, we will be getting another home later on this year. And we just opened another home in Chicago, uh, Cook County suburban area. And so that is so amazing for us to be able to do something like that. And so I just wanna thank you again for not only supporting our mission, but also making my dream come true as well. Being a formerly incarcerated, recovering addict and being able to make a difference. Thank you for helping me make the difference in these women's lives. in a no clapping church, but I just can't help myself. <laughs> uh, 
I'll begin with a question. Do you remember where you were when you first got the sex talk? Maybe at the kitchen table or riding in the car. That's a popular one. Maybe you were in a classroom or talking to a sibling or at summer camp. Maybe you never got an official talk. And even if you did, there's a good chance it left some important stuff out. Some well-intentioned adult in your life was just trying to get past their own embarrassment or fear or awkwardness and likely left a lot of questions unanswered. The 2004 movie Mean Girls has a scene where a gym teacher stands in front of his class and says, don't have sex because you will get pregnant and die. And sad to say, that scene still rings true for many people's experiences today. Plenty of people will say that the talk is strictly a parent's responsibility, and that when it comes down to it, thanks to awkwardness and avoidance and denial, parents aren't necessarily always prepared. And eventually, talk or no talk, everyone learns about sex in one way or another. You whisper with friends, you go to Google, or just learn from experience and do your best to figure it all out on your own. But growing up Unitarian Universalist, my answer to that question about where I first got the sex talk was always a simple one. I got it at church. While my Christian friends went to Wednesday night Bible study and my Jewish friends studied Torah every week, I went to OWL. <laughs> Our whole lives, and I learned about sex at my Mid-Missouri UU Church. I took OWL my junior year of high school when I was 16 years old, and I can look back on it fondly now. My teachers, one cis man and one cis woman, were trained volunteers from our congregation, and my classmates were my fellow youth group kids, ages 15 to 18. We started out so awkwardly, <laughs> but compared to the public school health teachers who were legally required to teach abstinence only and nothing else, our OWL teachers were honest and understanding and unafraid. They led games, answered questions, and talked to us seriously about sex and sexuality at a time when it felt like no other adults would. There were still some boring diagrams. There were still some statistics about teen pregnancy. But there was also a condom water balloon fight. And there was a lot of open discussion. Anything we shared in OWL was considered entirely confidential, including from our parents. So we were able to talk openly about insecurities, fears, past trauma, and current relationships. The class sessions were great, but what I remember most is the anonymous question box, which is a staple of the OWL system. To keep it anonymous, everyone had to write something on a note card every week and put it in the box. So sometimes our teachers pulled out a box full of doodles and notes saying, no question this week. <laughs> but sometimes they pulled out questions like, what is lesbian sex? Can you pee when you have a tampon in? Or could I get arrested for taking naked pictures of myself? And they answered every single one of them. Even when sometimes it meant they had to take a question home for a week and do serious research and bring it back next week, they answered our questions. My teachers seemed fearless to me at the time. They never blinked, never made us feel weird or gross for asking questions. But now that I'm their age and I have been trained as an OWL facilitator, I realize how terrifying that question box must have felt some days. It can be shocking to some, I think, to hear that OWL is offered to all ages, beginning as young as kindergarten. And yeah, it would be totally inappropriate to be answering those high school level questions in a class of five and six year olds, but those aren't the questions five and six year olds ask. Kindergarten OWL is about learning the names of body parts and respecting others' boundaries, speaking up and staying safe 
and also knowing about how families can look all different sorts of ways and not just the one mom, one dad, one kid that we see in picture books. Too often, the rhetoric around sex ed makes it seem like the only thing we could possibly be learning about is the how-to of sex. The tab A goes into slot B of it all, which means sex ed for kindergartners, how, how awful. But sex education includes this whole constellation of values, vocabulary, and questions that kids start asking way, way before they're even beginning to think about what it might mean to have sex or want to have sex. When little Taylor asks why Alex has two dads, or how Miss Sarah is having a baby even though she's not married to anyone, how do we as a community want to respond? With silence? By telling Taylor they're too young to know about all that yet? By teaching Taylor that some topics are off limits, can't be talked about, shouldn't be brought up, or should only be investigated in secret and on their own instead of asking a grown up? Or do we want to respond with openness and compassion, with simple honesty? Alex's dads fell in love and got married just like me and your mom did. Or with curiosity and questions of our own, like, why do you ask, Taylor, what's on your mind? Tell me more about what you noticed. What other kinds of families do we know? Or how many dads is the perfect number of dads? Kids live in the world. They see things and wonder things and ask questions. We can either teach them not to ask, or we can try to respond to them. Prepare them to find answers with the best tools we have at hand. Compassion, science, respect, autonomy, and a willingness to keep learning. Plenty of parents, good parents, hope that their kids will come to them with any questions they have, even difficult ones. But parents are also products of their own upbringing and can't answer every question. And when you're an adolescent, starting to find your way toward independence, there are lots of questions you don't want to ask your parents. OWL helps bridge that knowledge gap, and it does it in a way that Google or porn, which is where most people get their sex ed today, can't. Because OWL doesn't detach sex and sexuality from everything that comes with it. Identity, ethics, community, feelings, risk, and power. Sex ed is about accurate scientific knowledge, things like safer sex practices and birth control access, yes, but it's also about providing something no encyclopedia or Google search could provide. A safe space to unpack all the complicated dynamics involved in sex. Things like consent, bullying, love, identity, body image, and acceptance. It's a space that refuses to separate sexuality from the rest of our interconnected lives, from our values and community. Let me take a pause and ask, how would your life be different if someone had made such a space available to you when you needed it most? If you had learned about sex alongside peers who could safely ask questions, share insecurities, and find confidential, non-judgmental adult support, how would your world have changed? I know that without OWL, my own teenage years would have been scarier, more confusing, and less safe in almost every possible way. And sadly, this is an uphill battle in our culture at large. If you were to search for headlines about churches and sex ed, you would be far more likely to find yourself reading about abstinence only, virginity pledges, purity rings, and anti-LGBTQ messaging than about OWL or about Unitarian Universalists. The truth is, for many, the answer is yes, we should tell little Taylor to stop asking those questions. We should meet young people's observations and curiosity with shame and silence. And that this would be good. This would be for their good. 
For some, any discussion of bodies or sexuality or gender is inappropriate by definition, even harmful to children, and should be quashed entirely. There have been over 100 bills introduced at the state level across America right now, pushing for variations on this suppressive theme. Florida's bill forbidding any mention of sexual orientation or gender identity in classrooms, the Texas governor's attempt to define trans healthcare as child abuse, a Tennessee ban on any mention of LGBT lifestyle in public schools, an Oklahoma proposal to ban any book mentioning not just sexual orientation and gender identity, but also sex, sexual activity, or sex-based classification. There's this pernicious belief, not just among these most extreme social conservatives, but also often tangled deep, even within the most liberal of psyches, this belief that innocence is the same as ignorance. That if we want to protect innocence, then we must protect ignorance. And I hate to blame everything on Adam and Eve, but it does feel particularly meaningful that the creation story at the foundation of three major world religions features the fruit of knowledge bringing about humanity's fall. And specifically that after eating the fruit, Adam and Eve become ashamed of their naked bodies. They're bodies that God created, and they try to hide them, make them secret again. What does it do to a civilization to have that story nestled at the heart of so much of our history and culture? This belief that if we want to protect children's innocence, then we must do everything we can to preserve their ignorance as if by keeping sexuality something secret and shameful for as long as possible, we can create little childhood gardens of Eden, little paradises that once they are touched by knowledge are somehow ruined. But it doesn't work that way. And I don't just mean, practically speaking, rarely is childhood a paradise. I mean also that this is theologically wrong, morally wrong. Ignorance is not innocence. Ignorance doesn't have any kind of moral shade at all. It's just ignorance, just a lack of knowledge, just not knowing. Ignorance of sex has no mystical power to protect us from the risks or harms that can come with sex. Ignorance of gender diversity or orientation does nothing to make kids cis or straight. It just makes them confused and isolated and hopeless. Ignorance is not what protects children. Communities protect children. Communities that value listening to their voices, empowering them to know the difference between safety and danger, between love and abuse. Ignorance is not bliss. It never has been. Ignorance makes us vulnerable because it isolates us from each other being unable to articulate our own wants and needs and fears around sexuality just drives us into the shadows of shame and secret keeping, right when what we need most is a support system. Learning young about consent, about communication, and talking openly about what's normal isn't abusive, it's protective. So to many Unitarian Universalists, it's not just a good idea to send our kids into the world with accurate, comprehensive, and honest knowledge about sex. It's our moral responsibility to them. Unitarian Universalism as a faith community is committed to this work, not just because we think it's smart or healthy or good for society, but because we believe it is right. We believe it is sacred work. There isn't much evangelism in me or in UUism as a whole. We aren't really a knocking on doors with the good news type of faith. But OWL is something I genuinely believe is good news that needs to be shared. Because I look at the world and I see so much trauma at the intersection of sex and religion. I see so much harm being done by those who have made an idol out of ignorance and are willing to sacrifice a generation to it. 
about half of all UU congregations offer OWL or have offered it in the past. And about 10% of our Christian cousin congregations in the United Church of Christ have also offered OWL. That amounts to about 1,000 OWL programs nationwide. And I will say that ours right here in Urbana, Illinois, is one to be proud of. This congregation has been committed to offering one of the most impressive age ranges of OWL curricula over so many years with some of the most committed volunteers and families and a spectacularly ambitious vision for the future. We are out there organizing for trans kids in Texas and queer kids in Florida and Tennessee, and we are also right here creating and nurturing this countercultural space for the kids here and now who need it. And for people of all ages, for everyone who has ever felt confused or ashamed or ignorant about sex and sexuality, one of the most meaningful ways a faith community like ours can act is in refusing to be silent or to promote silence refusing to be disconnected from each other and from the knowledge and support that will allow us and the next generations to survive and thrive in this world. So may we continue the work of our whole lives, the work of sacred sex ed. May we honor the wholeness of our humanity and the holiness of every single part of our blessed human selves. May it be so, and amen. Amen? Amen. 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 Reverend Sally has asked that if I might offer this to you all, it's a body blessing created by Lisa Beauvais Kemper. And I invite you to follow along as you feel so comfortable or just to let the words wash over you. It's a moving kind of thing from where you're sitting. So I invite you to touch your hands to your own forehead. It feels natural. This, we're going to do a body blessing. May you be blessed with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. May your intellect take you far on your journey. You have been blessed with reason and free will. It is your call every day to use these gifts to our throat. May you be blessed with voice. May you learn the complex nature of truth-telling. The ability to speak truth in love is something that requires honesty, empathy, and care. You are challenged every day to seek the joy that comes with sharing your truth compassionately, as well as listening to others. Hands over our hearts. May your heart be full and blessed with love. May you know the agony of heartbreak as it is intertwined with the elation of true love. Your heart is strong and resilient organ, one that will be with you until the end of your time on earth. May you heed the wisdom of your heart and always trust the truth it tells. Bellies. You are blessed with the gift of sexuality. May you always remember that you are a beloved child of God, however you conceive that reality to be. Your body is sacred and belongs to you alone. May you live into the full expression of your identity as a human being, embracing your true sexual and gender identity. The gifts of sexuality brings with it many rewards as well as great responsibility. May you always retain power over your own being, striving toward mutuality, fulfilling, and just relationship. Now our hands. 
When you were a baby, your tiny hands were your first contact with the world. Before you could see more than a few feet in front of your face, you grasp the finger of your loved ones. You catch yourself with your hands when you fall, and you express love and comfort to others with them too. May your hands be gentle and strong. May you use them to carry light into the darkness and rest to the weary. May your hands always find the place of greatest need, beginning with your own. And may the creator of all things, the ground of all being, that beyond which there is no other, hold you in the palm of her hand wherever you go. Hugging ourselves, may you be blessed on your journey. May you remember that growth happens on the journey and that you are never, ever alone. May you always remember that you are a whole person, that each of these parts work together. We offer our blessings upon you, mind, body, and spirit. And may you be guided by compassion and truth, justice and love. May you find rest on the journey, always remembering where you come, came from, being mindful of your ancestors that stand behind you. Whether we are present on earth or have gone back to the soul of the world, may you be blessed in all things and carry blessings with you wherever you go. May it be so. It is my privilege to introduce a song. You're invited to remain seated and just listen. Let your spirit listen. Benjamin is going to sing this in Quan play. And I've been invited to introduce, as I said, I first heard this song some years ago and I started crying right where I was sitting. It's a song by a gentleman named Fred Small, who is blessed to be gay. And the song came out, he sang, created the song at a time where the world was an extremely dangerous place, not that it isn't still. And it's a, the song is the theme is this is a lullaby no one ever sang to me. Without further ado, the hit song that's found in our hymnal, I'm so proud to sing, but everything possible.
to Juan, to Benjamin, to Avalon, to Reverend Sally, to all of us. Amen? As we prepare to extinguish this chalice, let us remember to be grateful for the gifts of our bodies, whatever their ages, their shapes, their abilities. May we bring to our intricately woven animal bodies a sense of sacred respect and caretaking. In doing so, let us also be grateful for the great web of creation that designs and sustains life the wondrous mystery of nature that knit together each of our bodies, our beings, our individuality, and the universal force of love that celebrates our desires. Now, please join me as we say together our closing words, and they are on, up there, that we share each week, those at home and those in the sanctuary and those in Fellowship Hall. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. I'm headed straight to the South Lawn for coffee and snacks. You're welcome to join me there. <laughs>